Hello, welcome to Virtual Power Plant in the 20s, Moving from Theory to Practice. I'm Dominic Libertor with CPI. Um, I will be taking through a few introductory uh, slides and then I will hand it off to our moderator. So virtual power plants are systems that manage a network of dist distributed energy resources, or DERs. Various types across various types across a geographic area. Aggregating control of those resources to provide and be condensed for energy capacity or services to the grid. VPPs have been discussed within electricity circles for more than 20 years, with the first named installation in Germany in 2012. In recent years, increasing advances in distributed technologies, sensors and controls, Communications and automation have led to an increase in VPP installations across Europe, Australia, Japan, and the United States. During this webinar, participants will hear from speakers who have been analyzing, developing, and operating VPPs. The discussion will focus on specific examples where DERs are being aggregated to act as resources and or grid assets, in addition to providing customer benefits. We will explore how the installed VPPs are working, working from both an operational, technical, and economic policy perspective. Audience members will have an opportunity to ask questions, so um, definitely use the questions box, um, and we've got to those at the end. Uh, first, I just want to do, for the people that are here for the first time, um, explain to you what NARUC is. So we are a nonprofit founded in 1889. Our members are the state regulatory commissioners in all 50 states and territories. Um, essentially, our members regulate uh, electricity, natural gas, telecom, and water utilities. Um, and secondly, what is CPI? What is NARUC Center for Partnerships Innovation? Um, we are a grant-funded team. We provide technical assistance to our members. Uh, we have identified emerging challenges and connect state commissions with expertise and strategies so that they make, uh, they're asking the right questions. Uh, we build relationships, develop resources, and deliver trainings, also host webinars, as you see. Um, we have a, a big library of webinars and training material um, on our website, so I definitely encourage you to check that out. It is www.nehru.org slash CPI. Um, there's, there's a wide range of resources, and I definitely, definitely would like you guys to check those out. Also, we will have more innovation webinars. This is a monthly series, so please, um, please register for, for upcoming webinars. All right, so now I will hand it off to our moderator. Uh, Chairwoman Lee Marquez Peterson was elected to the Arizona Corporation Commission in November 2020. She was sworn in on January 4th, 2021, and elected by her fellow commissioners to lead the commission there in Arizona as chairwoman. Uh, chairwoman, please take it over. Thank you, Dominic, and, and thank you to Nehru for the invitation to participate today. As we all know, reliability and affordability are key to our rate payers. We've seen examples of states who've experienced rolling blackouts and have been impacted by weather and have scrambled for excess supply. Virtual power plants are an innovative way of ensuring reliability while not overinvesting in capital infrastructure that costs our rate payers a lot more. They also increase and extend the value of our existing capital infrastructure, such as by making more peaking capacity available for off-system sales when resources are scarce during periods of peak demand. During the summer last year, we saw demand response and virtual power plants play a key role in the reliability and affordability of the grid in the West Coast when California was experiencing rolling blackouts and resources were scarce across the entire energy market. Our utilities in Arizona definitely utilize these resources to their advantage during that time. And as a commissioner, I've been very supportive of them as well. The discussion today will focus on specific examples where DERs are being aggregated to act as resources and grid assets, in addition to providing customer benefits. We'll explore how the installed virtual power plants are working from both an operational, technical, economic, and policy perspective. We'll hear some interesting examples today on our panel. As a reminder, Dominic mentioned this, but please type your questions into the questions box, and we'll ask them at the end of the, the, end of the presentations. And now I'm going to introduce you to our panelists today. Uh, first off, we'll hear from Dr. Gabriel uh, Gabrielle uh, Kuiper. Uh, she is a Distributed Energy Resources Specialist and Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis guest contributor. 
Dr. Kuiper is an energy and sustainability climate change professional with over 20 years experience in the corporate world, government, and non-government organization and academia. She was previously the DER strategy specialist with the Energy Security Board, the peak body for energy policy in Australia. Prior to that, Dr. Kuiper held senior executive or senior advisory energy related positions in the office of the Australian Prime Minister at the Civil Society Organization, the Public Interest Advocacy Center, and in the new South Wales government. Our second presenter will be Cisco DeVries, who serves as CEO of Ohm Connect, which has, which has pays hundreds of thousands of residential customers in North America and Australia to reduce their energy use during peak energy use periods. Previously, he co-founded and led Renew Financial, one of the largest clean energy finance companies in the United States. His public service work includes serving as an appointee of President Bill Clinton in the U.S. Department of Energy and as a senior leader in local government. Our third presenter will be Graham Turk, who's head of customer care and an innovation strategist at Green Mountain Power. His work involves designing and administrating innovative programs in areas such as electric vehicle charging, energy storage, and responsive demand. These efforts contribute to GMP's larger mission to transform our energy system into one that is more distributed, carbon-free, and community-centered. Uh, so at this time, we'll hear from Dr. Piper and hear her presentation. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Peterson, and thank you very much for Naruk to the opportunity to speak with you all today. In 2012, I was a Churchill Fellow um, to the United States where I picked a lot of people's brains about what was happening with the future of electricity distribution networks. And so it's a great pleasure to be able to return the favour and share some of my knowledge and insights from Australia with you today. So quickly, the context for the Australian national electricity market. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a wholesale only market. Uh, we have a very high market price cap, that's Australian $15,000 per megawatt hour, and a price floor of negative $1,000 per megawatt. Interestingly, the price floor has not been um, significant in terms of the operation of the market until the basically the last year. You can see from the graph at the bottom of the slide that in fact, for the last quarter in 2021, we've had 5.5% of our trading intervals operating at negative prices, and that's in different regions of our electricity market. Uh, that those trading intervals out of interest are currently 30 minutes and are going to five minute intervals. Next slide, please. The uh, map that you see um, on that slide is of all of the transmission planned. Uh, there's up to $13 billion worth of transmission planned for our national electricity market over the next decade. I mention that because um, this may not be unique to Australia. In my view, we have a status quo bias towards large scale transmission and the creation of renewable energy zones. And there hasn't been su sufficient policy attention paid to consumers investment in distributed energy resources. The figure, in fact, by the end of 2020, we had seen over $4 billion in consumer investment in rooftop solar alone. Um, and that's with our commercial and industrial solar, which has just been taking off in the last two or three years. So the state of things are, is that we now have um, over 2.8 million households with rooftop solar. In South, the state of South Australia and the state of Queensland, over 40% of households have rooftop solar. If you fly into Adelaide, you see all of these glinting rooftops because so many homes have rooftop solar. And that is part of the reason why South Australia has gone from 0% renewables to 60% in a mere 14 years. Um, with my colleague Johanna Bauer, I wrote a report that documents that transition and that's on the IEFA website if you're interested. Next slide, please. So um, rooftop solar has been, become so significant um, that it is eating utility scale solar's lunch at lunchtime. So um, this is the, I guess, the mother of all duck curves. We had a world record in South Australia uh, on the 11th of October last year, whereby for one hour, 
of generation supplied to households and businesses in that state was from solar. And you can see the vast majority of that, 77% was from rooftop solar. Next slide, please. So that's the context. Um, I wanna to talk to you about three elements of um, DR integration and virtual power plants in Australia. The first and possibly the most important is a concept of dyna a dynamic operating envelope, sometimes known as flexible exports or a dynamic connection agreement. So this is a new set of software and systems whereby the distribution networks um, allocate a level of export or import capacity on a one or currently five minute interval um, to the connection point 24 hours in advance. Um, this, for example, enables in the example in the graph below, um, a static connection agreement of five kilowatts to be increased to up to 10 kilowatts, depending on the level of network capacity um, at the time. Um, and uh, encourage um, any electricity distribution businesses in the United States listening to investigate this um, as a possibility if you've um, got a large amount of rooftop solar going into your system. Next slide, please. On demand response, Australia has been behind um, the US significantly. Um, we are only getting a demand response mechanism in our wholesale market this year, and it will only be for uh, large, basically commercial and industrial loads at this point. We've had various trials of aggregated demand response um, for emergency peak demand response. Um, and um, I think that hopefully this will be of interest in the US. Um, our Australian energy market operator um, has just announced that they will be developing a minimum system load mechanism comparable to our RERT system for peak demand response. Um, so you can see from the graph on the left, um, and this is pretty much all the details we have today, but they're looking at setting a series of levels as demand falls by which they will call for responses. And the first of those will be a level at which there is a commercial response, either through demand increase or generation curtailment to help the system operator um, manage low levels of minimum system demand. Next slide, please. In terms of virtual power plants, I'm gonna talk um, primarily about our uh, virtual power plant trials that have been run um, in conjunction with the market operator. Um, these are the trials that we, the virtual power plants that we have the most information on at the moment. In terms of the services that they've been providing, um, their frequency response, we have six contingency, which is large scale frequency response markets, um, raise and lower it three different time intervals that you can see there. Uh, we also, um, this may also be of interest to have a fast frequency response um, market that's coming in a couple of years time. Uh, these virtual power plants were responding to market signals for frequency uh, raise and lower, and also it responding to what was happening in the wholesale electricity market. And uh, what we know from the data is effectively these VPPs didn't get out of bed for less than $300 per megawatt hour of the spot price. Obviously the highest and best use of most of these combinations of solar and batteries is gonna be in people's homes um, until there were price spikes. And the overall conclusion about the revenue from, um, from these virtual power plants is that they've been highly dependent on extreme price events. Um, in particular, we had a situation where South Australia was electrically islanded, uh, electrically isolated, islanded from the rest of the national electricity market for about a month, um, obviously operating alone um, equivalent to Texas. Um, there were price spikes for both FTAS um, and energy supply, um, and that uh, created revenue opportunities for those virtual power plants. Next slide, please. So um, we're waiting on the final report from these trials, but what we know to date is that virtual power plants work. No surprise, hopefully, to anyone on this webinar. Um, they can provide frequency control services. They can contribute to um, energy markets, and they can assist 
um, with minimum system load. In fact, um, AMO uh, pointed out the slide I showed earlier when there was the solar record um, battery charging contributed five megawatts of um, demand reduction to assist with um, system security at that point. Um, the market operator has found that there's challenges in terms of visibility of these distributed energy resources and the VPPs and how they operate. Obviously forecastability is a bit of a challenge as well um, and dispatchability is potentially a coming issue if these VPPs scale. At the moment, they're not scaling particularly fast at all, um, and but there are some commercial offerings, particularly from our large uh, generator retailers that are commencing. Um, consumers were satisfied and enjoyed um, generally participating in these VPPs. Um, however, the aggregator participants have not found the experience satisfactory. Um, basically, they found that it, there's too many requirements on them and too costly, um, particularly in light of the revenue totals that you saw on the previous slide. Final slide, please. I want to summarise um, where we're at. So, um, importantly, I think um, dynamic operating envelopes might remove the need for a distribution market operator. Be interested to have more of a conversation about this in the Q&A, um, but it's really a smart technical solution that enables virtual power plants, demand, uh, distributed energy resources to operate within network constraints. I haven't had time to discuss this, but um, electric vehicles will change everything. Um, obviously, the scale of batteries and EVs, um, six to ten times what we're seeing with these kind of power wall systems that were used in these virtual power plants. Um, and also that will change um, the financial um, revenue opportunities um, as well. Um, however, on the financial revenue um, viability side of things, I think with the Australian experience so far, the jury's really out. Um, except on those cases where there are extreme events, if you're talking about emergency response and price spikes. Um, I'll hopefully report back to you in a few years about um, whether or not that's changed, but that's where it sits at this initial stage. Um, on the non-financial side of things, I think it's really important to um, remember that there may be opportunities for consumers to be encouraged to respond, particularly to extreme ex events, um, with non-financial incentives. So there's some fantastic work done out of a social science team at Monash University, and they've talked about the important principle of appealing to um, households for non-financial um, public good measures. And it may be that that's something that needs to be explored further. So that's a very quick overview of virtual power plants and DR integration in Australia. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity and I look forward to the questions. Hello everybody, my name is uh, Cisco DeVries. I'm the CEO of Ohm Connect. It's a real pleasure to be with you and thank you for uh, bringing that presentation up. Um, I'm gonna walk through uh, the what Ohm Connect is doing in the virtual power plant and aggregated flexible demand space, uh, both in uh, the United States and in uh, more recently in Australia. So hopefully we'll give some, some good examples uh, to fill in where some of the things may be headed. Uh, but I'm going to focus most of our time on some of the experience we've had in California, which is our largest market. So we go on to the next slide. Uh, we are, uh, Ohm Connect is actually operating at uh, a fairly significant scale uh, in the state of California, where we are rated by the Public Utilities Commission at 150 megawatts of peak capacity that can be delivered during the peak summer months, like in August. Um, this is uh, uh, what we, the way we do that is a network now of closing in on 200,000 California homes and a few businesses 
uh, where we control or are able to cause to be controlled load reductions during peak times facing the grid. Obviously, what we're trying to do here is not just the emergency, in emergency break glass traditional demand response, which would be used maybe a couple times a year in order to help stabilize the grid in, in something close to an emergency, but instead to move towards a very used and useful, predictable, reliable uh, reduction in demand that can actually be uh, done near instantaneously and with very similar characteristics to traditional natural gas or other peaker power plants. We've seen the importance of this get bigger and bigger um, because of what you just saw before, the, uh, the duck curve in Australia, the duck curve in California, but also the increasing intermittency and issues with our aging grid. Uh, obviously, we're having heat waves and challenges keeping the lights on and air conditioning running in New York and Texas and California and other places around the country and around the world. Um, we are going to add to that electrification of vehicles and of uh, heating and other things that have traditionally used fossil fuels. So this is uh, something we have to get in front of now and uh, we have a solution. Uh, Ohm Connect does something that's really helpful here and, and this is basically just building on something that you all have known and we've all known for a long time. That physics doesn't care whether, you're, uh, whether you increase a megawatt of supply to meet an increase in demand on the grid or whether you reduce the demand uh, in order to meet reductions in supply or challenges with supply. It just needs to be equal at all times. Federal law for over a decade now has said, for uh, regulations have said, hey, all wholesale markets, you need to treat each megawatt the same. A reduction is, a, is the same as a production, but it's very hard to get that to actually work that way. Uh, so we have in fact done that at now at scale um, and are excited to take it to work. And in large part, what we've done is figure out how each individual thing in your home, how much it's worth in grid services and how to engage customers so that we can control those devices and appliances or help them do so, uh, economically connect the dots to them uh, and then create really large scale uh, on demand, demand reduction. So go to the next slide. Traditionally, to keep the lights on, essentially, as we move towards more and more renewable penetration, and as we deal with, uh, as the chairwoman said at the beginning, as we deal with these extreme heat and extreme demand events, we have about three ways that we traditionally keep the lights on, that we keep the power flowing. The first has been we fire up fossil fuel power plants, so-called peaker plants, traditionally about 50 megawatts, sometimes much bigger. Um, second, and we're starting to see more and more of this in Australia, as you saw in California, now at gigawatt scale, uh, battery storage, being able to deploy and dispatch in those times. The last, which in theory is the cheapest, fastest to build, is a virtual power plant. But it has been really hard to get lots of tiny little savings, tiny little adjustments in energy use to actually work like a symphony together and replicate the characteristics of storage or power plant. But that's what Ohm Connect's been doing and, and what I think the future holds for flexible demand and demand response. Um, we are able to produce megawatts, create the capacity for megawatts about 20 times faster and about uh, 30 times cheaper than the alternatives, but it does require some uh, table stakes and some things we'll talk about in a minute. I would also say that people say, oh, it's a virtual power plant, but we don't actually produce any power. And that's true. We are all about reducing demand in aggregated uh, coordinated events, not producing power. But we think it's still safe to say we're a virtual power plant. And uh, while some people's heads can explode a little bit around that, it's, it's, uh, it actually works that way now on the California grid. And I'll go to the next slide. We'll talk about that briefly. Here's how it works underneath. This is how it kind of works at the power and plant level. Uh, we bid into the California Independent System Operator 10,000 plus times a day. And we tell them uh, electronically, of course, exactly how many megawatts we have, exactly where in the state those megawatts are located hyper-locally, and at what price we would need to get paid to dispatch them. We do this both in the day ahead market and in the 15 minute sort of edge of real time market. So we can dispatch in the 15 minute market to deal with grid conditions. 
when we clear the market, we get paid the market clearing price for that power, and then we go ahead and reduce energy use to meet the dispatch. We do that by controlling today over 160,000 appliances and devices in people's homes near instantaneously and without, their, without notification or warning. They've given us that permission to have those controls. And that's everything from things like lots and lots of little smart plugs that we send people for free to smart thermostats like Google Nests, which we're trying to give away hundreds of thousands of right now, up to EVs, thousands of EVs, and now hundreds of home battery storage systems, all of which then we can coordinate and dispatch uh, within minutes. We also use behavioral when we need to get more or do extra, and that involves text messages and emails and is a really critical component. We then get paid for the energy we've saved, and we turn around and provide a big chunk of what we get paid to the families, to the residential customers that participated based on their participation. We'll show you that in a minute. Go to the next slide, please. Um, those of you, many of you out there are real experts in this. I wanted to just briefly for those that aren't to understand how that gets counted today. This is really sort of how the FERC uh, order 745 has been implemented. We will, there are different ways to do it, but the basic way is there is a rolling 10 day average for every single one of our users. And it looks just like this. That's the gray household energy use. It's done by a slight, some slight adjustments to the last 10 similar days. Then we actually track, of course, uh, using the smart meter data, what actually happens over the course of the day. And during an event where Ohm Connect is dispatched, we get paid for the difference between expected use and what they actually use. And you can see that number four, the green shaded box. We get paid at the market clearing price for energy at that point. That's how, generally speaking, we're measured, although there's lots of variation and differences which we can get into if people are interested in. We have a lot of opinions about this, but this isn't that complicated and we can make this work. Next slide. To a customer, now, so I've talked a little bit about how we get paid, how we interact in the market. Um, I wanna talk for a second about how customers interact. And it's important to recognize that again, this is not every couple of times a year or once a month. Last year in California, we were dispatched discreetly, our resources, over 1,000 times on 298 days. So we were incredibly active and incredibly engaged and our users often didn't know when that was happening. They just know they would get paid or get a message that some more credits had been accrued. They sign up very easily. It takes about a minute. Again, we send out lots of free devices and connect to things they might already have in their homes, like thermostats and car chargers. And then we automate the process of reducing, uh, and again, can push text messages and other things to get further reductions. In the end, you get to cash out or trade it in for things in our store, but uh, get gift cards, that kind of thing. Um, our top customers, uh, the very, very top couple of percent, will make four or $500 in a year. Uh, but the average is obviously quite is obviously significantly lower. If you go to the next slide, this is what it looks like uh, inside uh, the app when you're a customer. It's very simple. We use tools like you can see here on the far left side, status like platinum. There's a frequent flyer mile component. We want people to be consistently reducing, and we give you more credits, more points, more uh, payouts if you are consistent. We have you control your devices. You can tell us lots of things about when those devices can be controlled and you're always in control yourself. You can turn them off anytime you want, including during events or opt out ahead of events. You might not get paid, you might use more energy, uh, but you, the customer's always in control and we built this from that, per, from that going on up. You get paid in what we call watts. We just count the watts. You get paid, that's kind of our virtual currency and you can trade watts in for all kinds of things, as I mentioned, including cash. Go to the next slide. I want to show you what this looked like on one of the worst days the state of California has ever seen on the grid. So I want to start with August of last year. So in August of 2020, California had rolling blackouts due to supply constraints for the first time really in 20 years. Uh, and uh, during that period of time, which ran August 14th to about the 20th, so five, six day period, Ohm Connect engaged its customers incredibly heavily, but we also paid them very well. During that nearly week-long period, in aggregate, we reduced demand by a, a gigawatt hour, nearly gigawatt hour, 
uh, across all of our users and events. And we paid our users $1.3 million for those reductions. We were really helpful in helping keep the lights on during some of the days uh, 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 during that stretch of period, that period of time. We had another time, just a few weeks later in early September on a weekend in which the things were worse on the grid. We got lots of calls after our August experience from state officials that can you help a little extra? And we did. So what I'm showing you here is September 6th. You guys can all look at this. Uh, for those of you in California, I'm sure you remember, it was pretty scary. We had a 51 gigawatts of uh, demand projected and only 47 gigawatts of supply. We dispatched our users for two hours and held that dispatch. And what you see here on the right side of the slide is really important. This is the average of our users over a 24 hour period on the 6th of September. What you can see is at midnight on the far left and it goes down over the midnight hours, the early morning hours, and then it's a hot day. So big ramps in the amount of energy being used. You can see the first dotted line is actually the states declaring a flex alert and an emergency and asking for conservation, which helps. Then you can see what happens when we dispatch starting at 4.50 p.m. and the tremendous reduction in load across all of these users and that we held it nearly perfectly for two hours, the grid stabilized and we released. And this is what aggregated flexible demand that we can do that looks like a power plant looks like. We then turned over all the data to a, uh, for a Department of Energy study, uh, funded study, and they came back and said, yeah, you actually did what you said you did. It's actually a little bit better. So this has been third party verified. Now we did this at the 100-ish megawatt scale and obviously to be successful on the grid, we need to get the gigawatts soon. Um, next slide, please. So we've shown that this works at scale, at a reasonable scale, we need it to be bigger. We've shown that we can engage customers and get them to help to do something over and over again about energy or give us the ability to do it for them. And we've shown that it can work even in extreme events. The other thing that's really important is that it is accessible to everybody. 40% of our customers, low and moderate income. Um, renters participate. So what we've had now is the ability for lots of folks who haven't seen benefits from clean energy, who can't afford or haven't been able to afford solar or EVs, they actually now can figure out a way to participate, make some money. And most of our customers coming in, they start doing this to earn a little extra cash. Uh, they're proud of the environmental benefit, but they're doing it for the economics. If you go to the next slide, um, I, just on that left, you can leave it here, but on that last slide, we do Fresno. We are closing in on having 10% of the people of Fresno, California participating in, in Ohm Connect. So really significant scale in that community, just as a good example. So we went into Australia, did a partnership. Instead of being a third party independent power producer that plays into the market, we actually partnered with Origin in Australia. We launched a year ago, almost exactly. It's the same program, it works exactly the same, except that Origin customers can sign up directly and Origin, we call it Spike, they call it Spike there, Origin calls the events. We are not market dispatch, we're dispatched by Origin, but we are by Origin. So we are effectively a VPP inside of Origin and they, ex they then can dispatch us as needed, but otherwise works the same. We have now crossed well over 50,000 customers that are successfully participating in Australia. And hopefully we're just getting started with that partnership. It's gone really well. We're having a, a lot of fun. And it's a different way of using the technology and tools we've created inside of an incumbent energy uh, provider rather than as an external power provider in a wholesale market. Next slide. This is my last slide. There's all kinds of complicated pieces to this, and we're all still figuring it out as we go. Um, I wanted to say three really important things. Whether we operate as a third party independent power provider in the market, or whether we are inside of an existing energy company who's providing service to their customers, there are three things that become really critical. The first is data access. The smart meter enables all of this, but the reliable access and consistent access to that becomes critical. And that is a huge challenge, even now 10 plus years since smart meters rolled out in much of the country. The value of megawatts continues to shift around. MNV is not stable. What I say to people is what I need is stability. 
It doesn't have to be perfect, but in order for us to sign up customers, get them free devices, I need to be able to consistently know how to count savings and know for several years we're gonna use a similar rubric. Otherwise, private capital can't build this virtual power plant. We've raised $100 million to build 500 megawatts in California, but that depends on this stability and we have yet, even in California, to have it. Lastly, uh, this and the value related to this, the values also mean that we're up against, we're bidding today against uh, natural gas and coal fired power plants and we're winning, but we're not getting valued for the transmission and distribution. We're not getting valued for a lot of the other social and other benefits that are there. Um, and then I mentioned lastly on the MNV, the calculations and how this gets done, we get counted lots of different ways depending which and where we are, uh, and we need that to be stable and consistent. So with that, I will wrap it up and look forward to any conversations afterwards, but appreciate the time uh, and engagement today. Hey everybody, this is Graham coming to you from the Green Mountain State in Vermont. Uh, as Chairwoman Marquez Peterson mentioned before, I uh, manage our customer care team and work on innovative programs at Green Mountain Power. We're uh, about 75% of the state of Vermont um, and today talking about some of our battery storage programs. Uh, so apologies if this first slide is uh, a little bit elementary to anyone here, but just uh, kind of the underpinning of a lot of the programs we've launched is the value that we reap from our battery storage programs that makes all the numbers pencil out. And that's that our power supply costs are driven largely by the single highest hour of demand statewide in Vermont in each month, and then the highest hour of demand region-wide uh, in New England, we're in the ISO New England territory for the entire year. Um, I just looked at the forecast and it looks like today might not quite be the, the peak day, but it's very close. And so it's been an exciting day here talking through uh, how to schedule all of our peaking resources to make sure we hit that hour if it were to occur. We discharge our batteries to knock down those peaks and those costs savings flow through to all of our customers. Go to the next slide. There you go. So um, that's sort of on the, the cost side. Uh, in, in addition to that, as what motivated a lot of our work in distributed storage uh, was the fact that in the last six years, we have had four of our largest ever storms in our company history. Um, we are uh, over a hundred year old company and so a lot of history to go by. Uh, we are seeing more and more heavy wet snowstorms uh, where um, there are tons of outages statewide. These are two snapshots from them. Thankfully, I'm, I'm not the one in the bucket truck. I was uh, safely in our office answering phone calls from customers who were annoyed of being out for three, four or five days. Uh, that was in November of 2018. And so we know that these aren't going to happen any less frequently. Um, we, we're seeing more frequent, more severe storms, and uh, our responsibility to provide reliable power to all our customers doesn't just mean uh, tree trimming and sort of the traditional liability measures. We wanted to get creative and think of other ways that we can ensure customers can stay up and running during an outage, uh, which, which leads us to consideration of battery storage um, and being able to island not only individual homes and businesses, but now we're starting to get into being able to do it on a distribution feeder scale uh, with a, a solar and storage microgrid project, although that's not the focus here. So <laughs> we can come to that at a different time for now, more on the distributed fleet of, of aggregated storage we have and, uh, and a little bit of the context. So next slide, please. All right, so in 2017, we launched what at the time was the first, uh, first pilot of its kind. It was a utility owned battery lease program where customers were able to install a Tesla Powerwall for $15 a month or two for $30 a month. Uh, this program was for 2000 power walls, which was an aggregate capacity of 10 megawatts, the equivalent of about 7,500 homes off the grid during our peak times. And we see four key benefits for distributed storage. Uh, resilience are the customers that are participating. They're able to stay up and running during outages, just like if they had a backup generator, um, but with a much easier asset that doesn't require them to remember to fill up a propane tank or, uh, or you know, source fuel oil to make sure that runs. Affordability, uh, by using this aggregated fleet of storage, we're able to drive down costs, which has a, a virtuous cycle of, of helping to reduce our kilowatt hour charges that, that leads to more electrification 
in heating and transportation, which we need to hit Vermont's climate goals. Grid flexibility, storage is perhaps the most flexible asset, or though not, not the only one, obviously. And, and as Cisco mentioned, you know, lots of other resources that can help achieve this, but allowing us to shift load around uh, to, to consume when renewable generation is high uh, and ride off that battery storage at times when there's not as much renewables or prices are higher uh, and we'd like to be avoiding consumption. And lastly, carbon reduction. We are dispatching these batteries often at times when uh, the grid is at its dirtiest. It's peak times when the uh, least efficient natural gas power plants or oil in New England would be coming online. And so displacing that dirtier generation in exchange for uh, much cleaner stored energy in the batteries that is charged during off-peak hours. Go to the next slide, please. So just a little bit about how it's gone. So that was in 2017. That program was fully subscribed. Uh, and not only were we able to see cost savings, but uh, some really amazing instances of customers riding through long outages. In this case, a customer who had solar paired with the batteries was able to stay up and running for a four-day outage. Uh, he wasn't exactly being stingy with his usage. And while we don't recommend running all of these appliances, if you uh, are, are facing an extended outage, it, it was a cool instance and many like it where uh, this really provides the peace of mind that customers need to, uh, to be able to keep living even when the grid is down. Go to the next slide. Awesome. So building on our experience in the pilot, uh, we filed two tariffs in 2019. These uh, went through a full investigation in our PUC, um, slightly different in the, in the format. One is called the Bring Your Own Device Program. In that, we provide an upfront incentive for customers who share access during peaks uh, to their battery storage system. And there's four compatible systems that you could see at the bottom. Uh, we provide an incentive of $850 per kilowatt or $950 if it's in a constrained area. And those are pockets of our grid where there's so much solar, distributed solar, um, that, that adding more would present a costly upgrade for the substation. Uh, and so adding storage allows us there uh, to have more flexibility to avoid pushing back to the transmission grid during um, times when daytime solar is abundant. Uh, and so want to give an extra incentive for, for building storage in those pockets. The energy storage system lease, uh, otherwise known as the Powerwall lease, is a $55 per month flat charge, works just like a subscription for two Tesla Powerwalls uh, over a 10 year lease period. And uh, within that, we have six certified installers uh, that you can pick any one of them. Customers can, can choose who to work with. If they're already working with one of those companies to do solar, um, they can add on to, to add Powerwalls. And, um, and so far we've now been running these both for uh, just under a year and have seen really strong uptake continuing from the pilot. So uh, it's been encouraging to see that we didn't we didn't just capture all the interest in that pilot period, that interest has remained strong. And uh, unfortunately, as we continue to, to see prolonged outages, not just in Vermont, but all over the country, um, you can typically see a, a, a bump in interest correlating with times when uh, grid resiliency is on the mind, whether it's, it's uh, in other places or, or right here in Vermont after a, a big heavy wet snowstorm event. Great. So a little bit about how the fleet has performed. Uh, you can see up top, this was the last year's uh, ISO New England peak, and we were able to deploy 13 megawatts of, of aggregated uh, batteries, which, which at that level is, is the second largest generator, actually, uh, if you take the aggregate capacity in Vermont behind only a, a wood chip burning plant in the Burlington area, uh, and that translated directly into a million dollars saved. We also have had great stats on how many hours of avoided outages this fleet has, has been able to deliver. And so this example uh, back in 2019 was one very prolonged outage, but uh, we're looking into potentially using the data from, from what we get directly from the batteries as a way to, uh, to incorporate into our reliability stats. Um, because as we see it, when we are deploying these assets, it's no different than, uh, than tree wire or a recloser or a traditional piece of infrastructure on the grid. It helps us deliver power to customers when they need it and avoid outages. Uh, and where, whether it's coming from a battery or coming from the grid doesn't really make a, a whole lot of difference from, from our perspective. And go to the next slide. So the takeaways I'd like to put out, you know, I think that as we've, we have now about three years of experience, either through the pilot or the tariff, um, I think one is the importance of, of piloting. It, it really allowed us to experiment with ideas, to have the flexibility to, to fail 
uh, make mistakes before we were to able we were rolling something forward to a more permanent program. Uh, we learned, for instance, in the Bring Your Own Device program that a monthly incentive uh, was was nowhere near as popular as providing an upfront credit. Customers were looking to uh, to have a more affordable um, loan or or an outright purchase price. And even though the monthly credits added up to the same as we would have provided upfront, uh, it was a much different payback model and it was a little bit harder of a barrier to overcome. Uh, in addition, we did move from offering a single power wall to two as standard in our uh, our power wall tariff. And that was mainly because two power walls are, are really necessary to provide whole home backup. Uh, customers can still purchase a power single power wall in the Bring Your Own Device program, but it only allows partial home backup uh, and the installation can be a little bit more complicated. You need to add a sub panel. So just two examples of where you know, having that pilot was was critical to helping us work through some of the issues and have a a much more sturdy program. Uh, we were able to build on our experience when we ultimately moved it to a tariff. Uh, another big piece um, that as part of the tariff proceeding in the investigation, um, a question into, you know, is, should GMP own battery assets? Um, is, it, is it the utility's place to own batteries? And our position um, was that with a technology as new as, as distributed storage, where customers are not familiar with the compensation models, uh, it's changing all the time, that us being able to own and provide maintenance over the course of that battery's lifetime uh, delivered simplicity and certainty for the customer. So they only had to think about, well, what is resilience worth to me? Uh, can I uh, can I afford that $55 a month charge and not have to worry over time of if every time they responded to an event, were they getting paid for it? And did that make the math pencil for them and what resilience was worth? Uh, and the last thing is, um, just to say that you know, these are assets that pay for themselves effectively. You know, the combination of the supply, power supply cost savings and the lease payments we receive more than compensate for the cost of the batteries uh, without any sort of allowance for the value of lost load or valuing resilience. Customers have basically answered what resilience is worth to them um, for those who are willing and able to pay that lease charge, but we don't bake those into the model at all. Um, and so it's it's an interesting case of uh, you know, not having any subsidies. We're still able to make make it pencil uh, just because of the immense cost savings that we achieve by deploying our storage at those peak times, at those hours when it's most important uh, to drive down costs. So I will hand it over back to the chairwoman and, and happy to take any questions and, and a big thanks to everyone for attending and uh, to the other panelists for such awesome insights. Thank you so much, and thank you to each of our speakers uh, this afternoon. It's been very, very interesting. We've received a lot of questions. We're going to get to as many as we can in the time we have. Uh, and if your question isn't answered, we'll be sure to get those to our speakers and see if there's a way to get that out to all the participants. Um, and we'll start with just a few here. Uh, Dr. Kuiper, question for you. Um, they said, I agree that EVs will change everything. But how are you solving the charging issue? And what do you see as the future of lithium batteries? Oh, awesome questions. Um, I don't, we haven't solved the charging issue um, in Australia at the moment. Um, and I think um, this is a major coming challenge to ensure that um, first we put in place requirements for two-way charging so that people can use their batteries to, char to power their homes or their businesses. Um, and then once it's viable, we need to ensure that a vehicle to grid um, capacity is enabled. Um, there is a working group looking at EV charging standards at the moment, um, but that issue certainly hasn't been um, solved in Australia. Um, I'm not quite sure what the question was in terms of the future of lithium ion batteries, but I think one of the things that's fascinating um, is that people have said, well, lithium ion batteries obviously have um, limited capacity in EVs at 60 or 70 percent of capacity um, they're not going to be useful so you're only going to have a limited lifetime in the EVs but what we're seeing now and I don't know if this is happening in the US but is a number of pilots where used EV batteries are actually being used in networks so company the equivalent of Green Mountain Power uh, taking used EV batteries and putting them into substations where they can provide an incredibly cheap form of backup power or network support. Um, so I think, you know, we need to think about EVs as um, having multiple 
lives as as mobile batteries. Um, to give you another fantastic example to follow from Graham's discussion about how to deal with extreme weather events related to climate change. Our city of Newcastle, um, small city of about a million people, um, they are, have put a solar farm at their waste dump essentially in recycling facility. And then they've purchased uh, electric garbage trucks. So the garbage trucks will go to the dump, dump their load and charge from the solar at the dump. And then those, uh, and I think it's very important to remember that people think about EVs as a Tesla or a, a you know, sedan kind of car. But because these are garbage trucks, these are actually even bigger batteries on wheels, right? And so the city of Newcastle is looking at though that fleet of garbage trucks as being able to provide power in emergency circumstances. So if there's a flood or a bushfire, they will be able to send those garbage trucks to the say the local community hall where people have been evacuated to and be able to provide emergency power in those kind of circumstances. Uh, very innovative. Thank you, Dr. Piper. Um, we have a question for Cisco. Uh, the question is, you said you were paid per the energy reduction. How long ahead is the baseline created? Day before, week before? How does the utility or the market allow for a predicted reduction of load? Do you provide the market a predicted load curve versus a real-time load curve? Uh, really good question. Lots to it. Let's uh, let me just very briefly, and we can certainly happy to chat offline and track me down at my, you know. So, but. Uh, Way we, we get paid in two ways. The first is we sign capacity contracts uh, to reserve our capacity for um, you know a year to up to now ten years, and those contracts um, uh, that we operate those contracts are with utilities. So we are on the supply side with load serving entities, the CCAs or utilities in California that are buying power. So that that's one part. And then second part, we execute into the market daily, um, multiple times a day. And uh, that load curve is created for every single user. So every single one of our residential customers now, closing on 200,000, each one, we have that data, we roll it, you have a projection for that prop, for that uh, customer, and it is a 10-day rolling average. So it looks back 10 similar days. And that's a FERC, you know, not a mandate, but that's kind of how FERC uh, says to do it. So we then, uh, so then that reduction between what was expected based on the 10 days and what they actually did is the payment. We also have to, if we get netted out, anybody who used extra, um, you know, so it's, it's all net based on the meter readings in 15 minute increments. Um, lots more we get into in the details of how it works through there, but that at least gives you the, the flavor for um, the M&B. Okay, thank you. A uh, question for Graham. Uh, what is one piece of advice you would give to a utility looking to launch a battery storage program? Pilot, pilot, pilot. Uh, <laughs> I know it's a little trite, but yeah, I, I think that there's so much value in, in trying things out at small scale. Um, like I said, we, we learned so much from that experience, and I think we're, we're very grateful to have uh, a forward-thinking PUC in Vermont that, that gives us the, the range to do something like that. Uh, where they recognize it's not going to be perfect out of the gate, but the value of doing it for real and gaining that experience so outweighs, uh, you know, anything else that we'd be able to learn by um, even talking to customers before the technology is actually in their hands. You know, they can predict what it might feel like, but um, until it's deployed and you're actually operating it, it's it's hard to get a sense of of what it will be like in the wild. Great, thank you. Good advice. Um, let's see, question for Dr. Kuiper. Um, the questionnaire wrote, I recall reading recently about community level microgrids in, I think, Western Australia. Do you know about this? How do they interact with the state's grids? Do they provide VPP type services also? That's uh, my perfect question because I really wanted to talk about this topic but didn't want to take too much time. Um, so. I've only talked about the East Coast. The West Coast is a completely different system and totally fascinating. And Western Power, which is the transmission and distribution um, utility that covers Perth and um, the sort of southeast, uh, southwest of um, WA, um, they are, in my experience, the furthest ahead in thinking about 
the future of um, their network. Because what they've done is they did the analysis and they realized that the, the majority of their network was serving a tiny proportion of their customer base. And they said, well, that's not sustainable going into the future, especially when we know um, the price of batteries is falling, solar is also still continuing to fall. So they've developed a transition plan for their entire network. They're still going to have a below ground network in Perth and above ground network in town, but they are actually starting to dismantle the grid in remote and regional WA. They're putting in standalone power systems um, where it's viable and they're putting in islanded or islander bull microgrids in large parts of the state. Um, so they're completely changing the nature of their network. They refer to it as a modular grid, um, looking at different kinds of network configurations depending on the population density. The other important consideration for a lot of the networks in Australia is bushfire risk. So um, you probably saw the media coverage around um, our very black summer where we had incredible destruction from bushfires and we had a huge amount of um, fires which took out electricity networks and some, in some cases were started by those same networks. So that resilience piece, sort of the opposite to the snow example that Graham provided, the other extreme weather event is to ensure that we have um, resilience um, by looking at what we can do um, with microgrids there. So I really encourage everyone to look at what Western Power has done there. I think um, they've been really forward thinking um, the East Coast is a little bit further behind. Um, there's a regulatory issue there that in contrast to the United States where you've got, I heard discussion about the ageing grids, a lot of our grids are very new and have been paid for and there's a big question about how do you write down the value of those networks if you put um, microgrids, for example, in place instead. Um, I could go along about this for a lot longer, but I know there's another question you need to get to. Thank you very much. A question for Cisco, and if we have time for Graham also, but for household batteries, does the household operate the whole home? Or are there prioritized circuits like the refrigerator? Is there concern or even conflict between VPP dispatch and batteries during stressful times and customers wanting batteries at high charge for resilience in case of outage? I can answer for this great combo. I'll be really quick on mine, hand over to Graham. So we, we do, um, control and connect with hundreds of home battery systems and we we are do not as california you cannot get paid for dispatch so putting battery storage electricity back into the grid is not a thing that uh, has been figured out uh, regulatorily what however you can do is is reduce is use the battery to reduce the load on the home during that key time and that, of course that's a benefit of batteries in general uh, so we do do that um, we can do things like some pre-cooling and other things in the home and then allow the home to kind of island off its batteries. We can shed non-essential load in the home during those periods of time. Uh, during that August heat wave I mentioned, we actually had, uh, you know, just using the demand response flexible load payments, we were paying some of our uh, folks who had significant battery storage uh, one to $200 a day uh, for the ability to island their homes and reduce their load. Uh, so that was uh, it's pretty significant and obviously we can imagine as you go towards grid dispatch for 2222 those kinds of things could be a lot better great thank you and graham would you like to take that question also just real quickly Oops. i'll okay. try it in a minute uh, which is that yes it's it's absolutely a conflict especially on days like today when it's hot and humid and there's also thunderstorms um, we tend to uh, try our best to call off dispatch if it's going to conflict with an elevated outage risk. Um, and, and so we'll reserve them, charge them all up, and make sure that they can ride through and be available for customers. Uh, but it, it's something that we're, it's always on our mind. And uh, on the circuit question, we're now moving more towards whole home backup, so customers don't have to pick and choose which circuits uh, would be backed up. But I know that there's companies um, that are working on sort of setting profiles for during their outages and making sure that the most critical loads are backed up. Uh, and I just want to caveat what I said earlier on the piloting. I think it's important that it's not a pilot that sits on a shelf uh, and is never touched. It's, it's something that there's a deadline to turn those learnings into 
a fully fledged program. Um, and just one other example of, of a quick way we did that, which is we started with manual dispatch, where we were looking at our, my lights are going out, <laughs> telling me to get off the phone. Um, <laughs> we're looking at, uh, at doing manual dispatch, where we would look at our power forecast and call an event for a fixed period of hours. We've moved to an automated dispatch with Tesla, uh, and that allows a lot greater flexibility where we don't ne necessarily need to go for a full three hours. We can pull back if it turns out the peak is no longer a risk, and that's delivered a much better experience for customers because they have more power in their battery, and also for us because we don't have to be as engaged day to day to make sure uh, that we're catching every possible peak that might come up. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll, we will turn it back to Dominic, but thank you again so much to each of our speakers today. It was very interesting. We really appreciate it. And Dominic, if you'd like to close us out, please. Yeah, thank you all so much for being a part of this. Um, this has been a great webinar. Um, thank you all, um, audience, for joining us. Um, if you want to check out our site to for upcoming webinars, please register here. Um, I put it in the chat just a few minutes ago. You guys should be able to find it there. Uh, we do these every month, um, and you know they're they're real exciting and really timely topics for our membership. So thank you all. Uh, thank you all attendees. Uh, thank you moderator. And thank you um, ch uh, chairwoman, and thank you panelists. Um, we will catch you next month for enabling robust stakeholder engagement at public utility commissions.